Tony, I've been involved in the religious freedom debate quite actively, and in all that time, no one has ever come to me and said, can you please make it easier to kick gay kids out of school? Not once. And if they had, they would have been laughed out of my office and laughed out of the office of any of my colleagues. Uh, the truth is, though, there is a federal law and some state laws, uh, including one that was passed in 2013 by uh, Mark Dreyfus as Attorney General under the Gillard government, that did allow schools uh, to uh, expel students based on their sexuality. I think that law is wrong, uh, and I think the Australian population overwhelmingly agrees with that sentiment, and that's why this week, uh, or this sitting fortnight, I should say, the government is going to move with the opposition to get rid of that. When it comes to teachers, uh, I believe that schools do and should retain the right to hire teachers who are, who are willing to teach the values of that school. And I want to make a very clear emphasis on willing to teach the values of their school. I'm not interested in any other characteristic about that teacher except their willingness to teach the ethos of their school. So will you legislate, as with students, to stop any religious school sacking a teacher because they're gay? Well, the first cab off the rank, Tony, is dealing with students because there's been a lot of fear raised in the community. Okay, let's go to the second cab because that cab's already gone. <laughs> well, the, the second cab we're going to deal with as part of the wider response to the Ruddock Review and we'll look at that. But I think it is important that schools are able to hire teachers who share the values of the school and want to teach that to students, just as it's important, for example, that an LGBTI organisation should have the right to hire staff who align with its values. And I don't believe we should force them to hire, for example, a conservative Christian who opposes same-sex marriage. That would undermine the ethos of that organisation. I don't want to see it to happen for them or, or for Christian schools or, for that matter, Jewish or Islamic schools. Well, Tony, parents send their children to faith-based schools for a range of reasons, but one of the reasons is that they hope that their values will be instilled in their children. And if someone works at one of those faith-based schools and is not willing to participate in instilling those values in, with, those, with the children, then clearly they have a problem and, and it's probably not uh, the best place for them to work. And happily, we've got a pluralistic education system where there are public schools and there are other non-denominational private schools where there are options available to you. So this is not something that everyone would choose for their can I children. Just say, can I say one question? Uh, mm. They're taking money from secular taxpayers, so that's going into religious schools. Should they not therefore abide by secular rules. Well, Tony, I very strongly support the principle of educational choice and also the freedom that all parents enjoy to control the moral and religious upbringing of their children. And the government absolutely facilitates that with taxpayers' money, as we should, because a private school shouldn't have to compete entirely against the well-funded public system with no uh, government your pardon. funding at all. I'm sorry. Well you can't sit there. I, I worked in a, a public school just last year and you cannot tell me that the public system is well funded. Uh, it is well, not. Linda, I went to a public school. In fact, I was entirely educated in the public school system and by any international standards, Australian schools are exceptionally well, All right. well funded. We, we, last we, year was record funding. Next year will be record funding. The year it, after that will be record funding. Well, I want to come back to Neve's original question, was, which was about when the environment's going to become a priority. And the truth is that the environment is a priority, but it's one of many priorities. So, for example, yes, it's very important that we have a clean environment and that we make our contribution to combating climate change. But it's also important that we deliver affordable energy to people. geoffrey has been talking it's about really how not. it's between the big companies versus the people. Well, we've got a state election happening here in Victoria at the moment, so I've been out door knocking with some of our state candidates. And when I knock on their door, they say to me, please get control of power prices because we can't afford to put our heater on in winter. We're worried we're not going to put our air conditioner on during summer. That's a serious priority that also has to be balanced against our environmental objectives as well. So, James, just briefly, the report, the new report, the IPCC report, makes it clear that by 2030, coal-generated power globally will have to drop by 78%, or, and that's below the levels at 2010. So um, it sounds like what you're saying partly seems to be code for we need more coal fire power generation because it's cheaper. Is that what you're saying or not? No, I'm not saying code for anything, Tony. I'm just recognising the reality that it is today. 60% of Australia's electricity generation today comes from coal-fired power stations. Around the world, particularly in Asia, coal-fired power stations are being built in their hundreds. Uh, it is going to be a big part of the energy system for many years to come, and willing that away won't make it happen. Make a, make a plan, make a timeline, tell the world how you're going to decarbonise, and then we'll all be happy to hear from Australia that there's really a plan. All we see is one Prime Minister after another falling over this issue. <laughs> but, but, but we don't see any action. 
Well, Jeffrey, as much as I would like to think that the world is waiting to see what Australia does, and yeah. as much as I think we're a very important player in the globe, the truth is that we make up about 1% of global emissions. And if you shut Australian industry and jobs down tomorrow, it would make no difference okay, to right. the global climate. James Patterson. Well, Jeffrey's absolutely right on that. Australia is a small, open trading nation, and while all nations are hurt by trade wars, Australia would be particularly hurt by a trade war. Um, on your question about bipartisanship on economic policy, um, actually this week in the Federal Parliament we will see an example of bipartisanship on economic policy, and that is the government's initiative to bring forward tax cuts for small business to reduce them down to 25% uh, rate of tax, which will make them more internationally competitive, small and medium-sized businesses, is being supported by the opposition. It's a different position, I have to say, to what they had a month ago, around a month before that and a month before that. But this week, we do have one example of bipartisan economic policy. And any fear in the highest levels of government of a possible uh, uh, global financial crisis being brought on by the trade war? Well, the Australian government's position has been made very clear by our Trade Minister, our Prime Minister and others, which is that um, we urge both the United States and China to take uh, steps away from uh, what appears to be an escalating trade war because it's not in well, their interest. it is interests. an escalating trade uh, war. Well, it certainly does appear to be, and that's not in their interest or in our interest. I mean, it's not interest of American consumers who are going to pay higher taxes. It's not in interest of Chinese producers or consumers. And it's certainly not in the interest of Australian farmers, business people, consumers or anyone. Very good. Uh, James Patterson, first. I mean, uh, do you offer support to the argument the welfare state is destroying our society? Well, Tony, there is some good news on this front. Although under the previous government, previous Labor government, a city the size of Geelong, 250,000 people were added to the welfare system. Under this government, since we were elected, a city the size of Darwin, 140,000 people, have left the welfare system and entered the work. 1.1 um, million jobs have been created since this government was elected, and that's one of the benefits of that. And welfare dependency in Australia now stands at a 25-year low. So that is a really good thing. Um, to, to the wider points, Tony, uh, yes, absolutely, the government believes that the best form of welfare is a job, and it is much better for people to be in work if they're able to be, be in work and if they can find work, and it's important that we support them to do so. OK, but you wouldn't want to undermine the welfare system that we have in Australia. Well, we, ha we don't have a, a national health system like they do in the UK. We have a mixed public-private system mm. that provides really good choice and efficiency and competition, and I think it works really well. OK. Well, Tony, foreign aid does have a role to play, but the question was, uh, was asking how do we solve poverty? And I think it's Jeffrey's friend Bono who put it best when he said that entrepreneurial capitalism has reduced poverty far more than foreign aid ever will. Uh, we know what the durable permanent solutions to poverty are. It's the rule of law, secure property rights, free trade, economic freedom. That's how China, in the last 30 years, has reduced their, their absolute poverty by 660 million people. It's one of the most phenomenal human achievements that happened in just the last 30 years. And it's by even only a cautious and uh, moderate embrace of those institutions. If we saw those institutions embraced on a worldwide scale, we could have a much more profound impact on poverty. Relevant Imagine. to point out, just Tony, just quickly on, quickly on that, it might be relevant to, to point out to, get to, another to your viewers that some of those cuts came under the previous government, and it was Bob Carr as foreign minister who said you can't run a foreign aid program on a deficit budget. And I think there is some truth to that. I think we we do need to restore the strength of our budget and get back to surplus before we can be even more generous overseas. As Jeffrey, a quick response. Really Jeffrey, I, I just want to say it's fine entrepreneurship, everything else, but let's not sloganeer when the question is. Getting kids in school, getting basic health care, getting basic it's clean not water. Yeah, it well, is. what you're talking about is not going to save those kids next year. So you got to get real. And what you're saying is a slogan. So well, Jeffrey, with respect, lots of things no, no, that you have recommended haven't worked no, either. I'm and, sorry. No, no. With respect, what I have helped to lead has been a massive decline of poverty on the same side as you helping to get markets to work, helping to get trade to work, helping to get people to work, but also Jeffrey. helping to stop diseases and helping to get children in school. And if you do any professional work on actual budgeting, then I would tell you what you're saying is a glib slogan, well, not a reality about what development aid is about. And please, Australia, <laughs> please do your part. You're a rich wonderful, beautiful country that can afford to do more and poor 
desperate children need it so that they can grow up to be healthy and be productive in our world. And Australia, really, we count on you for that. Just very quickly, Simon. Yeah, very quickly. Um, Jeffrey, you should know from your own experience about what some of the limitations of foreign aid are. In fact, a UK government review of your recent Millennial Villages project in Ghana showed that after five years and the expenditure of £11 million of UK taxpayers' money, that virtually no progress was made that... on poverty and hunger. You read the Daily Mail. No, I read the report. <laughs> I read the report. <laughs> well... The full report is printed out on my desk. Yeah. At Frankly, I read the report also, and it said yeah. that multidimensional poverty was cut sharply and that incomes went up, so you read a different report. No, that's not okay. read no, the no, Daily no, Mail. No one said you can't. James. David, it's a good point, and I think it's, a, it's not an either-or, though. We need to value the service of our Anzacs, obviously, because it's a key, key part of our national story and our, our identity as Australians. But we need not to forget that there are many more veterans of more recent conflicts who are still alive today who need our support. So I hear you absolutely on that. I think actually one of the great things about the Invictus Games is the emphasis that it does put on finding employment for veterans, on valuing their service uh, in recent conflicts and showing them to be people who are capable of doing amazing things because we need to send the message to the community that veterans are highly employable, highly skilled, should be highly valued, and, but, I, but I hear you absolutely. Should there be some sort of task force to deal with this problem? I mean, we get these questions week after week. We often don't... Uh, have someone uh, as articulate as this to put the questions, but it's a serious underlying problem in our society, not dealt with by government. Look, I think that's fair, Tony, um, but there are a lot of amazing people out there doing really good work in this space. Soldier On is a, is a really impressive charity that's been looking at these issues, and mental health particularly have re recently returned servicemen. Sure, but should, is it time to make it a priority is what well, I'm Well, it saying. absolutely is a priority. It always has been, and it's, it remains so today. Uh, Linda.